Hey everyone, and welcome back to a new video. When you get a new camera, there's always a learning curve to get a handle on what your camera can do, where to start, and there always seems to be a bad surprise or two in your first few outings until you get your settings figured out. I'm going to help you avoid this because in this video, I'm going to go over the settings that you should always change or set intentionally on any new camera rather than relying on the default settings. You'll want to stay until my bonus tip, which is one you'll definitely want to change. Otherwise, you may end up with this. Guess what it is? My name is Simon Dantremont, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature and wildlife photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. First off, a warning, there are people pretending to be me using my photo making comments in the comments below offering you prizes. These are scammers, stay away from them. One of the most fundamental settings on any camera, and often the very first setting in the menu, is shooting in RAW versus JPEG. These are two file types that your camera can use. RAW is like a digital negative, an unprocessed and uncompressed version of your photo without any alterations. As such, it's often a bit flat looking and the files are very large. This is the best for image processing and getting the most dynamic range out of your photo. JPEGs have some adjustments made in camera to make them pretty right off the bat. This is the best choice if you'd rather not worry about image processing, want a quick workflow, and want to share your images quickly and easily on many platforms like sending them to your phone and posting them right away on social media. JPEGs are also compressed making the files only a quarter of the size of RAW files, so your memory card can hold more of them and you don't need as much storage space on your computer. Remember that if you choose JPEG, the look of the photo is determined by a selection in your camera menu. On Canon, it's called Picture Styles, Picture Control on Nikon, Film Simulation for Fuji, and on Sony cameras, Creative Style. Make sure to pick the one that's flattering to your style of photography. Portrait mode will give you less sharpening for softer skin tones. Choose vivid for punchier colors. Sunset mode for beautiful reds and oranges. You can even design your own. You pick what works for you. If you want to get the most out of the benefits of RAW in a smaller file size, try out compressed RAW. I've tried it and it's great, especially at half the file size of RAW files. Another of the fundamental settings in your camera is to tell it how you want the autofocus to work. The two main styles of autofocus modes are one shot and continuous. In one shot, when you hit the focus button by half pressing the shutter button, the camera achieves focus and locks the focus at that point, usually confirmed with a confirmation beep. This is the best setting if you shoot inanimate objects or subjects that don't move, but make sure they don't move if you choose this setting. This is because if you take multiple shots in a sequence, your focus point isn't following your subject. If they move, the first photo may be in focus, but the rest of the shots in a fast burst won't. If your subjects are usually moving, the best choice is autofocus continuous. This is AFC in Nikon or Sony, AI Servo on Canon, and on a Fuji camera, put the focus switch to C. This way, as your subject moves around, your focus point is continually tracking and moving with it. If you keep the shutter button pressed, the camera refocuses for every shot keeping those shots sharp. For sports, wildlife, motorsports, or air shows, this is what you want. If you'd like to be able to switch quickly between these two as you change subjects, some cameras will allow you to program a button to switch between the two. A couple of features that are really handy but often not set to enabled in the default settings are the level and composition grids. The level is just a great feature on any camera for many genres. For landscapes and architecture photography, it's super helpful as in those types of photos, not being level sticks out like a sore thumb unless you're doing it for artistic purposes. Even for me as a wildlife photographer, I'm often scrounging on the ground to get a low angle and I'm half upside down while I'm doing it and which way is up gets suddenly complicated. The level allows me to get shots of my subjects where the horizon is level behind them. Composition grids are another tool that allows you to help frame and compose your shots by superimposing helpful framing and compositional tools on your LCD or in your viewfinder. Most models will offer you the rule of thirds grid, 
but some also crossing lines or six by six grids. If your style of photography needs you to get the composition just right at the time of taking the photo, these may help you by giving you guides as to where to place important lines and horizons in your photo. For example, in a landscape shot with a beautiful sky, you may choose to have the photo be two-thirds sky and one-third land, whereas a photo with a boring sky may be best served with two-thirds land and one-third sky composition. It's up to you. While you're here, by the way, I should take the time to say thanks. I got a package left on my doorstep from YouTube this week, and it's all thanks to you. A silver play button commemorating hitting 100,000 subscribers. I was super fortunate to hit that in about 10 months, which was awesome. Were you one of the early ones? If so, let me know in the comments below. Here's another setting that you should set intentionally, and that's the number of focus points. Most cameras can switch between one or many focus points. These points, when over a target, help the camera focus on that target. If your subjects are easy to track and put your focus points on, or you want to have lots of precision like placing the focus point on the eye, select a single focus point. If your subjects are always on the move, sometimes placing a single focus point on the subject is just too difficult. This is the time to have several focus points, improving the odds that one will hit your target. Some cameras now have subject or eye tracking as an option. This is a great choice if you shoot portraits, pets, your kids playing sports, or wildlife, as often the eye or the body of the subject is the focus point you want to have in the photo. Choose this option for those types of photography. Like in some other options we discussed, this is one you may change from day to day. Find out if your camera allows you to change those using the buttons and dials of the camera rather than digging through the menu, really speeding up this selection. One of the settings that I rarely find helpful by default is the option to rotate images shot in vertical orientation, i.e. portrait mode, so that they stay upright when you turn the camera back to horizontal orientation. While this may work for some people, the problem is that the resulting image is tiny on the back LCD, making reviewing your image really difficult. You can turn this off so that when you look at your image on the back LCD, it stays in the size of the entire LCD. Now you may want it to stay in the vertical when you move the camera camera back to horizontal orientation, and if so, that's great. Me, I prefer to review my images full screen in the vertical orientation. On a Canon, this is called Auto Rotate, Rotate Tall on a Nikon, Display Rotation on a Sony, and on a Fuji, Auto Rotate Playback Display. This one isn't complicated. Many cameras will make all kinds of beeps, especially when achieving focus or maybe when the shutter goes off. In many cases, it's just a personal preference, but if you're a wildlife photographer, or taking pictures at a chess match, or the photographer in a wedding ceremony, camera beeps can be annoying. Just turn them off in your camera menu. Another setting which you'll want to consciously choose is how many photos do you want the camera to take when you hit the shutter button? One or many? Most cameras will allow you to choose between one shot at a time and a high frame rate, and maybe a setting in the middle where it keeps you shooting, but not too many frames per second. If you like shooting deliberately and with intention, not taking more photos than you need to, choose single shot. If on the other hand, the odds of getting just the right shot, a great pose, the moment the ball hits the bat, or catching a unique moment is improved with a high frame rate, set the camera to high speed rate of taking pictures. My camera shoots at 12 frames per second. And as a wildlife and nature photographer, that allows me to capture just the right moment or pose that makes the shot special. But if I'm out shooting nightscapes, one shot at a time is all I need, so I set my camera to shoot in one-shot mode. When you get a new camera or borrow one from a friend, one setting that you'll need to make is sometimes overlooked, and people wonder why the view in the viewfinder isn't sharp. That's because cameras have an adjustment in the viewfinder to compensate for our different vision, called the diopter adjustment. Binoculars have this too. This allows you to adjust the viewfinder for your vision and to best be able to see the image and any settings that are displayed there. It's not difficult. Just locate the diopter adjustment dial, look into the viewfinder, and make adjustments until the image looks sharp. To note, sometimes this gets bumped or changed unintentionally, like when I'm wearing gloves in winter. If your viewfinder starts losing sharpness, this should be the first thing to check. One great feature that many people don't take advantage of is most cameras have the ability to allow the user to customize the file names of the photos written to the card. In many cameras, you can even set up two profiles if you have multiple users of the same camera. You can use these to help identify your photos later on on your PC, keep track of who's using which memory card, or even start a new naming convention when you start a new project or trip. 
to help you track which of those photos is for which project. This one should be easy on a new camera as you should get asked when booting up a new unit for the first time, date and time zone. But in case you don't, it's a good idea to set this up properly. If you don't have it set, you may end up trying to figure out which photos go for which trip or which project or shoot later on and having to go through the photos before you can put them in the right folders, for example. When I shoot two different days for a project like YouTube videos and then go to load the footage on my PC, the date is actually for me the easiest way to sort the right photos in the right project files. And I promised you a bonus tip. Now, while many of the things we discussed today wasn't me telling you what to do, but rather make sure you make an intentional choice for this setting, this one is almost a no brainer. This is the setting that tells your camera if it's okay to take exposures without a memory card in the camera. These unfortunately come often from the factory set that indeed they can take photos without a card. Likely so that in the camera store, you can see the camera in action without a memory card. But once you're back home, this is bad. Just imagine going out and taking some wonderful photos only to come home to notice that there's no card in the camera. Luckily, some cameras these days give you a warning if there's no card in the camera. Change the setting so that the camera won't release the shutter without a card in it. One more setting that I always change in my own cameras is setting the camera to back button focus. Very popular with wildlife photographers and in many other genres as well. To find out how this works and if it's right for you, see my video on it right here. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and YouTube will show it to even more people. I hope you can go out there and put these tips to good use and get your own great, amazing photos. I know you can do it.